Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get us started because we've got uh, a great panel today and I want to be able to get through as uh, much information as we can. Um, thank you again so much to everyone for being here uh, for our latest installment of Homeroom with Education Leaders. Uh, we're really excited about today's webinar because we're really branching out into some of the new, uh, some new sectors, uh, housing and health and, and food security. Um, so I'd like to thank our panelists for being here today, Director Garcia, Secretary Sibelius, and Superintendent Thurmond. Um, if you've missed any of our past webinars, uh, you can find them on our website. Um, we've had about 10 webinars, 13 webinars in this series so far, and we're really excited to keep it going. Um, throughout the conversation, uh, we have made it so that you won't be able, unfortunately, to use your audio to chat with us uh, since there are quite a few people on the call. Um, but if you do have any questions, we will have a bunch of time at the end uh, designated to speak, uh, to answer those questions. So please feel free to submit them into the Q&A and we'll get to as many as possible. Um, after our opening remarks, we're gonna hear from our panelists for about 20 minutes before we get to that Q&A section. So you'll have plenty of time to think of any questions that, that come to mind. Um, if you, one last note, if you have any, um, any uh, social media that you wanna follow along in the conversation, please feel free. Uh, you can use the hashtag at homeroom on Twitter. Um, and this is also uh, streaming live on Facebook. So please feel free to interact there. I would now like to get started uh, by having the Hunt Institute's president and CEO, Dr. Javed Siddiqui, give us some uh, opening remarks. Thanks, Julia, and thanks for your great work putting this uh, panel together. First, I want to welcome and thank our, all of our panelists for joining us today. I know how busy you all are, and I appreciate you taking time to be with us at the Hunt Institute. Uh, and thanks to all of you who made time to join us for today's discussion. As uh, schools are winding down for the first semester, we know that all of you have incredibly busy schedules during the day. Uh, but the intersections between health, housing, and education and what solutions we've seen around the country for developing holistic approaches supporting all aspects of a student's life, as well as the families. Uh, it, this is a very important conversation. Today, our panelists will be addressing how different agencies at the state level can come together to strengthen support for our students. As a former principal uh, and local school board member myself, I've had too many encounters with students and families about a child's academic challenges or behavioral issues, uh, only to learn uh, that they did not know where, where they were sleeping tonight, uh, what they will be eating today, tomorrow. And this pandemic has only exacerbated these real challenges and shined a bright light on what we educators have known for years. We can't expect a child to be reading on grade level if they're worried about their next meal, or if they're worried about, uh, will they have a roof over their head tonight? This is a rare time for everyone to come together to plan and discuss best practices to meet all the needs of all students. And we are hopeful these conversations will help create some, some of these solutions. Uh, so thanks again to our panelists for joining us this afternoon uh, to have this very important conversation. And uh, with that, I'll kick it back over to Julia to begin our conversation, Julia. Thanks so much, Javade. Um, we're gonna start first uh, hearing from Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. Uh, we are very excited to have her. Um, she is, uh, in addition to being the former governor of Kansas, uh, the former secretary of the US Department of Health and Human Services. And we are uh, very blessed that she's here today. Um, so Secretary, could you uh, start us off by providing some insight kind of from a national perspective around some of the challenges that students are facing right now in terms of health access and you know, how, how can that impact student learning and, and what are some potential solutions uh, nationally and within states that uh, can address this? Well, Julia, it's good to join you and these um, experts on the panel today. I'm, I'm pleased to be with you. This is a really important conversation and I don't pretend to be an expert in this space. Some of my colleagues uh, who you'll hear from in a bit are experts, but I thought maybe um, as a start off, I could set the stage a little bit. Um, we've heard about uh, kids who are hungry aren't good students and can't learn very well. Kids who are worried about their roof over their head uh, may not be able to uh, do their homework in a place that is quiet, may not have uh, opportunities to do ongoing learning um, and be worried all the time. Those issues have been with us for a long time and uh, you know, there are various solutions. What we've had with COVID is a extraordinary accelerant poured on the fire of what is harmful and troubling to children in this country. Uh, we've had schools that are 
open and shut and open and shut, uh, which causes lots of social and emotional disruption, lots of fears from parents that their kids are going to get sick, lots of fears from teachers. Um, we have kids who are struggling in home situations without the technology they need to even be connected. We have teachers who weren't prepared to necessarily flip immediately to uh, technology and to a remote learning pattern. And that just in the learning space has caused enormous disruption. We have 400,000 Americans who have died. Each of those deaths has impacted children in that family. Some are directly related to parents, some are grandparents, aunts, uncles, beloved family members, nurses, uh, people, children have seen death at a rate that they have never seen before in their lives. We have 14 million children, the highest number ever recorded in this country, who are suffering from food insecurity, which I think is too polite a term. I mean, these kids are hungry all the time and they can't think about much else but being hungry all the time. Just by way of comparison, that's five and a half times the number recorded in 2018. So we have seen this exponential jump. And if you're a black or brown child, you are much more likely to be in that category. Uh, so we've exacerbated that situation. We have 20 million children living in a household where somebody lost a job. Uh, and the pressure that comes on kids from that, it may cause homelessness, it may cause food insecurity. We know at a minimum, it causes a whole lot of family stress. It causes a whole lot of uncertainty. It causes a whole lot of anxiety. And the kind of support systems that children were used to in schools, not just food, often two times a day with a snack you take home and a backpack that's for the weekend, but counseling services, health services, support services, early intervention, teachers who know that the clothes are particularly ripped or torn and there's something going on at home. None of those support systems are in place right now. So we are gonna face an absolute tsunami of colliding crises when we somehow get back to normal. Uh, there's a lot in incoming President Joe Biden's plan to deal with these, help to rebuild a childcare system, help with lots of health workers, look at rent stabilization, direct help to parents, getting folks back to work. And over and over again, one of the things that is pledged in the first 100 days is get all the schools open and do it as safely as possible, knowing that that is a safe and secure place for kids to be. And then supports can be built around that. So I think areas where community schools already exist have managed to wrap services around kids even in this troubling times we need more of that model and again the biden plan talks about that we need to really do not only serious learning assessments of what has been lost in terms of academics but the enormous mental health toll on children some of whom were performing very well some of whom were already suffering from trauma and social issues to begin with. So there's not only going to be a lot of additional work, uh, there's talk in the Biden plan about doubling the number of non-teaching personnel in schools, nurses, counselors, mental health professionals, uh, psychologists, because those were already missing services, but we know they're going to be more needed. And a real focus once again, and I know it's a uh, one of former Governor Hunt's uh, basic uh, hallmarks is early childhood education, a commitment that we have every three and four year old in a safe and secure and learning environment to be uh, ready for academics uh, by the time they're five. We had a plan at the end of the Obama administration where the Department of Health and Human Services in collaboration with the Department of Education mapped out a program that um, I think would have been pretty good. I'm, I think the Biden team is likely to lift a lot of those ideas and move them forward. HHS runs Head Start, Early Head Start, and Child Care. Uh, the Department of Ed runs the education system starting often with four-year-olds. So the combination of those streams of not only money, but uh, expertise and um, social, emotional, as well as educational opportunities will be key. Uh, so a lot, a lot to do and a lot to talk about.
Yeah, thank you so much. I think that's such a great way to set the conversation and really give us a, a great perspective going in. Um, I think we're going to turn next to Director Rick Garcia. He's the director of the Colorado Department, executive director, excuse me, of the Colorado Department of Local Affairs, uh, and also formerly the regional administration or administrator for uh, the housing and urban development for uh, his region. Um, and so, Dr. Garcia, can you speak a bit more specifically about what you're doing in Colorado uh, to really approach this challenge of, of housing, housing insecure students, uh, homeless students? How has your department worked with the education system and the healthcare system uh, to really secure the best possible outcomes? Yes, thank you, Julia. And let me first thank the Hunt Institute for the invitation to uh, join today's webinar and particularly to be uh, along with uh, former, uh, former HHS Secretary Sebelius and also California Department Super, uh, Education Superintendent, Tony Thurman. Let me tell you a little bit about DOLA, the Department of Local Affairs before I get into some particulars. Uh, DOLA, uh, the Department of Local Affairs uh, is a unique department in state government. It was created and is governed by statute to provide technical and financial assistance to towns, cities, counties, and local districts. Uh, DOLA also operates the State Division of Housing, which administers all state general funds and federal dollars uh, directed to build new and rehabilitate existing affordable rental housing, as well as we provide Section 8 vouchers and permanent supportive services for Coloradans who are unhoused. Uh, currently, the Housing Division directs nearly $100 million of housing subsidy annually to both private and nonprofit developers. So here at the state, we have focused on helping youth and students experiencing homelessness to secure housing and connect support services so they can maintain housing stability and therefore improve their personal well-being and also their academic achievement. This focus has continued during the pandemic, and we also realize this through various partnerships with other state agencies, such as the Colorado Department of Education, the Colorado Department of Human Services, and our Medicaid Administration Agency, Healthcare Policy and Financing. Let me focus primarily on four areas where uh, we are uh, dealing with uh, uh, homeless youth. The Office of Homeless Youth Services, that is the, uh, the state of Colorado is one of few states in the country with a dedicated office focused on youth experiencing homelessness. Through statute, we have the Office of Homeless Youth Services. This is uh, housed within the Division of Housing, and this office facilitates advisory council for homeless youth services, coordinates the annual youth survey, provides technical assistance to stakeholders, and the coordination of resources for youth experiencing homelessness. Second, we also put our focus on transition age youth. It's interesting that through our annual survey, we approximate about 40% of youth experiencing homelessness now in Colorado had some form of involvement with uh, child youth welfare. The Division of Housing has various partnerships and one in particular is with the Office of Family and Child Services. A couple of programming examples that we're involved with is a program called Pathway to Success which provides transition age youth with case management, all of our state funded vouchers and other support services. We also focus on the HUD family unification program, which provides vouchers for unaccompanied youth, as well as youth that are considered parenting. Our next step program, which is probably our most popular uh, through the next step to end program, we partner with service providers in school districts and local public housing authorities to provide homeless students and their families with both short and medium term rental assistance and support to create stability and improve their personal well being. These outcomes are for both students and their families. During the COVID 19, we've utilized some of the CARES Act HUD dollars, specifically emergency solution grants, also known as ESGCV funds to expand this next step program. In fact, these awards have increased our next step program by $2.1 million and added five new partners serving 225 households and six new school districts. This is added to the 11 lead organizations and school districts 
already serving 400 households across 16 additional school districts. During the 2018 and 19 school year, more than 22,000 children and youth were identified as homeless. And we know that this number is going to continue to increase and is at risk of even increasing further because of the public health pandemic and the economic crisis. Fourth, creating supportive housing for youth. We know that homelessness ultimately ends when someone, and particularly youth, are in a safe place to call home. And connecting someone to housing and support successfully ensures ending homelessness. In Colorado, we have prioritized the creation of quality, supportive housing throughout the state. This includes youth experiencing homelessness. Since 2019, we have supported the creation of 130 supportive housing project-based housing units and 35 supportive housing tenant-based units. Additional supportive housing projects are already in various stages of pre-development and we'll continue to see these applications grow even during the pandemic. Here's a couple examples of how we're partnering with CASA, the Court Appointed Special Advocate Organization, mostly in Western Colorado to provide youth who are exiting from the welfare system into stable housing. In addition, uh, two rural counties, Delta and Montezuma in Western Colorado uh, have recently received grants to build housing to help these students transition into safe places after they move out of uh, the foster care system. In addition, here in the urban areas, we also have uh, assisted in building 40 new construction units in the heart of downtown Boulder, Colorado, and another also in the Western Colorado in Grand Junction, designed specifically for 18 to 24 year old youth transitioning out of foster care homes. We also have put a lot of emphasis on the COVID-19 recovery through our state emergency operations center. We have a task force that has include that includes homeless youth providers, and this is managed by our own Office of Homeless Initiatives. This task force coordinates key emergency response, public health, provides homeless providers support, including youth providers, and also all people experiencing homelessness. Also, our Department of Human Services has a healthy transitions program, which works to improve engagement and access to mental health treatment and support services for youth and young adults ages 16 to 25 years old who are either at risk or experiencing homelessness. This program centers on providing a voice to inform and create sustainable clinical and community support for homeless youth. Also other state agencies like the Department of Education also has used their CARES Act education funding through the elementary and secondary school emergency relief program fund dollars to work with local education agencies to also adhere to adult education and family literacy act requirements, the Perkins CTE Act, and also the McKinney Vento Homeless Assistance Act. The Department of uh, Colorado Healthcare Policy and Finance, one of our state's Medicare agency, also focuses on providing access to healthcare enrollment, assessment, care coordination across all populations, but we also put focus on including homeless students and their families. And then finally, let me mention a little bit about some of the COVID related rental assistance programs that the state of Colorado has been involved with. A recent survey of 356,000 Colorado households, this was last month, have indicated that they are not either caught up on housing payments or will not be able to make payments, uh, housing cost payments uh, in the next month. So we have stood up several rental emergency assistance programs to keep people housed during this downturn and the economic crisis. The state legislature and the governor's office has allocated $35 million direct for emergency housing assistance to individuals and property owners. These programs together have involved 25,000 households have received some direct support to keep them housed as well as over 110 formerly youth uh, who were homeless since we stood these programs up in July. A special legislative session of the General Assembly in December of 2020 
appropriated another $54 million to continue these rental assistance programs into 2021. Many of these households served are working families who have been impacted by COVID and they have school aged children who will be able to remain enrolled in school without having to be moved due to an unplanned eviction. The second federal stimulus recently passed by Congress also includes additional emergency rental assistance. This will allow Colorado to build on these very effective programs to help stabilize housing for unaccompanied youth and those transitioning out of foster care. Thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Garcia, for that really uh really detailed and comprehensive overview. And I, I think that's such a stark reminder of the, you know, the data around um, the, the housing concerns that people in Colorado are feeling. Um, and so now to hear a bit of um, more education focused perspective, uh, we're gonna turn over to Superintendent Tony Thurmond and we're welcoming him back to the webinar series. Um, so Superintendent, can you talk a little bit about how your department's collaborated with you know, the housing and health entities in your state to support students and families? And you know, what has worked? What's still a challenge? What, uh, what are you still thinking about? Thank you, Julia. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Siddiqui. It is truly an honor to join this conversation uh, with you, Secretary Sebelius, as a career social worker. Uh, I've always admired the work that you've led in health and human services. Dr. Garcia, thank you for, uh, Director Garcia, for calling out so many of the important programs that we need to provide uh, for homeless youth. In California, before the pandemic, we've had more than 270,000 students that we know of who are homeless. As Secretary Sebelius has said, everything about this pandemic has simply uh, just made this situation, it just has um, really just accelerated the challenges that families were already dealing with. You can look at that from the standpoint of families that were living in poverty to the number of students who were on the free and reduced lunch program to those who uh, are, are experiencing uh, challenges around our efforts that were ongoing to close our opportunity gaps. All Everything has been exacerbated by this pandemic. Simply put, we are dealing with the moment that is the toughest challenge that we will face in our lifetime with 400,000 Americans having lost their lives, with millions uh, in, you know, in every state who are impacted by the pandemic, nothing is more important than our efforts to get the vaccines uh, to as many communities and our school communities as possible. But we know that in the meantime, the pandemic takes tolls on our families in so many different ways. Thousands of students in our state never really checked in even when we first went into distance learning in March of 2020. What we know now is that many of those families were struggling for basic needs, for meals, um, a family member may have been evicted, may have lost a job. And so our state, like others, has provided all kinds of rent subsidies, um, uh, eviction protections. The pandemic EBT program has just been so important. More than 3.7 billion families in our state using the pandemic EBT program. You know, we've got a thousand school districts that meant that means that, you know, hundreds of locations across the state where our students were able to receive a meal or two, in some cases, three meals a day, because we know that for many students, school was the place where many of our students received meals. And so these challenges are great. You add to that that in many of our communities, our, our communities have been impacted by natural disaster and by fire. And so we've been working with our families and our schools to get what they need to make sure that they have access to face masks, and, and, and PPE. Uh, in many cases, our schools have been burned down. Um, families have lost a loved one. So we've worked to move resources to those families to help them get basic needs, food, water, hotel, relocation assistance. Uh, obviously, this pandemic has uncovered a very embarrassing fact for our entire nation that we have allowed the digital divide to exist for all these years. In California, that means more than a million students when we went into the pandemic didn't have a computer. Now we've been able, we created a task force on closing the digital divide. We moved hundreds of thousands of computers and devices to our students, including many students who are in foster care. As, as, as difficult as that sounds, we recognize that many of our students needed those kinds of supports. But yet what we see is there's still a million students who don't have access to high-speed internet. So we have many challenges. And of course, as Secretary Sebelius pointed out, the social impacts, the mental impacts on our students. They've experienced high rates 
of depression and suicide. We've made our focus providing supports for social emotional learning. Our state has provided upwards of $5 billion to school districts to address digital needs as well as social emotional learning needs. Our office has continued to provide professional development to our schools on how to deliver quality social emotional learning supports. We work with our schools on their efforts to uh, address those students whose attendance you know, has, has been exacerbated since the pandemic. Literally, students who just haven't checked in. And we are literally making phone calls to many of these families to find ways to support them. And I just have to say, as if all of this wasn't enough, that we would see such devastating examples of racism playing out on our television screen every single day, seeing the killing of George Floyd, watching our nation's capital attack violently, the attempt to overthrow our government and, and, and white supremacist. You know, we've essentially said to our schools, we're gonna hold you, we're gonna support you. We've been providing them grants to use education to counter hate, to, to talk about the contributions of people of color, you know, so that our students can have self-esteem and be proud. We've decided that even though the pandemic had disrupted a lot of the programs that we funded because of the impacts on the economy, that we have to double our efforts on closing opportunity gaps, on closing learning gaps. You know, we, so in that way, we're sponsoring legislation that would give young people paid internships because we recognize that young people may be contributing to their family's income. We recognize that maybe half of our students in public universities right now, they were already food insecure. They're even more vulnerable and maybe up to half of them were thinking about dropping out during the pandemic. And so we're accelerating our efforts to provide more Medicaid dollars for mental health programs and wraparound supports to make sure that there are more supports for students directly through career training, and that we provide more family engagement and resources to close what we call equity gaps. Because we know that for English learners, for students of color and students in low-income communities, these equity gaps have been exacerbated. And, and so we are accelerating and doubling down our efforts to help students in, in each of these areas. And of course, uh, Julia, we're happy to work with all the various state agencies, um, housing, health and human service, and others uh, to help make these resources come to fruition. Thank you so much, Superintendent. And I always love hearing the passion that you bring to the conversation. So um, really appreciate all three of your insights, uh, getting us started with these opening remarks. And we've got about half an hour now to dive in a little bit deeper on some of these, uh, these topics that you've brought up. Um, once again, to the audience, if you have any questions that are coming to mind as you're listening, please feel free to submit them into the chat. Um, we had some that were sent in, uh, some pre-submitted ones. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and get started and. Uh, start uh, with Secretary Sebelius and um, we'll get to those those other questions as we keep going. So um, Secretary, uh, you have such an interesting perspective, you know, really at the state and federal level, really uh, kind of diving in on all of those uh, different areas. And one thing we've been hearing a lot about uh, during COVID-19, as you brought up, is the impact and the association uh, between isolation and student uh, behavioral and mental health. Um, and students who are food and housing insecure or starving and homeless, um, you know, they tend to be more susceptible to some of these behavioral and mental challenges. And so how can the federal government play a role in this? And, and how can they approach uh, this challenge of supporting student mental health, especially for these at-risk students? And, and then what can be done at the state level to really implement those efforts? Well, that's a great question. Um, we talk about, um, in the in the health world parity between physical health and mental health but it's still talked about as two separate items it really isn't um if you are depressed if you are traumatized if you are frightened if you are anxious you're not healthy uh and it isn't really that you can be totally healthy and then have these other issues it's it's all in one and if you have any of those conditions you can't learn as well as others you can't think as well as others, you can't focus. So it's a cumulative problem. Um, Medicaid, uh, first of all, I, I would be remiss by not just reminding folks that tomorrow um, we will have a new president sworn into office and 
there is a very robust commitment from incoming President Joe Biden to be a federal partner in all of the areas that uh, the director from Colorado has outlined and that the superintendent has articulated. Uh, that hasn't been in place for a number of years. Uh, the federal government has kind of withdrawn from being a robust partner and in many ways put up blockades and barriers to people to access health programs, to access food programs, to make it more complicated and difficult. So those days are coming to an end tomorrow. That's good news. Congress finally has appropriated money for states and local governments to work on some of the initiatives that were just described that have to be done at the local level with um, housing initiatives and food initiatives and hiring back workers and making people safe and secure. So that is coming. Medicaid is probably the most significant tool in the federal toolbox. Medicaid is already the largest transfer of funds from the federal government to the states, bar none. I mean, more money comes through Medicaid. Every state has a Medicaid program. Every state has it set up. So one of the things that can be done really relatively easier is just turn up the dial flood the zone with Medicaid money and combine that with what is happening in many states, but not enough states, is allow Medicaid dollars to be used for um, what we would call drivers of health services. So what we know about health is it is not you know, what goes on in a clinical office. It's often the air you breathe, the food you eat, where you sleep, where you eat, work, pray, play, um, all of those elements of someone's life and a child's life makes him or her more healthy. And so by loosening, if you will, or focusing on what's called the social drivers of health, what are the wraparound services that can make a child healthier, which is really in keeping with the Medicaid program and expanding Medicaid access to more children, you have a win-win situation and driving that money as rapidly as possible to states, which can be done by just changing the FMAP formula. You don't have to pass complicated new legislation, you know, you just turn the dial up and rather than a 60-40 federal match, you could make a 70-30 and 90-10, you know, you can drive federal money very quickly to states. States then can take some of their match and move it elsewhere. And you can outline the areas that it can be used for. That could be enormously effective. The other thing that I think the Biden administration has talked a lot about is we don't have enough non-teaching resources in schools. Teachers are called upon to be nurses and counselors and mental health professionals and diagnosticians. By moving non-school personnel into the school setting, you not only deal with the kids who are there, but often you deal with their family members. Kids bring family health problems to school. They bring questions about an illness their grandmother has, what their little brother is suffering, and they, they can bring it back. Having school health personnel available to families in the neighborhood is the fastest way to get community health care, trusted health care. Um, so the school clinic idea, the school health personnel idea is really, really important. And mental health professionals are often lacking in schools, both counselors, but really child psychologists and uh, folks well-trained in trauma. I mean, if you think about a child who's had a family member or two or three or four die from COVID, who have lost their home, who somebody has lost a job, who is now moving from place to place and who doesn't have enough to eat, that's a lot of trauma for a child to try and absorb and deal with. And so having those personnel on board, again, a commitment from the incoming Biden administration that that has to be part of the recovery. I, I like to call this a 9-11 moment for public health in this country. If we don't use this horrific virus and the economic downturn that was created by this virus to really strengthen the resiliency of our country, we know now that you can't be an economically viable country unless you are a healthy country. We know that we have way too many people without adequate access. We have way too many people on the front lines. So this is a moment at the city, state, and certainly federal level to say, not only will we build back, but we have to make sure that 
the old way of doing things, which still had hungry kids and homeless kids and you know too much trauma, that, that we tackle those underlying causes and really use this as a moment to um, make schools the center of a healthy child uh, phenomena, uh, both with food security and with housing security and with health, including mental health security that we've never done before. But schools, I think, are the best nexus to children and their parents. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and I think that's such a great point. Uh, the role that the school plays in the community is huge and really can't be can't be overlooked. Um, I'm going to go now to Dr. Garcia. Um, and, you know, one challenge that we've seen uh, for education systems, not just uh, during COVID, but uh, it's been exacerbated by COVID, is tracking highly mobile students, you know, students who are moving around from school district to school district throughout the year. Um, and many students who are housing uh, insecure are doing this quite frequently, and it can be kind of difficult to assess their well being, their safety, their academic progress, uh, and their social emotional skills. Um, so what are some ways uh, for agencies at the state level to collaborate to, to really support districts and making sure these students don't fall through the cracks? Great. Thank you for that question, Julia. You know, and I think uh, Secretary Sebelius really hit on a great point that I want to also emphasize. Uh, in that the days ahead are going to bring back to a place where we can see large collaboration, cooperation agencies. Uh, in bringing forth the kinds of resources and policy uh, endeavors that are going to make a difference, and particularly those living on the edge and the margins of our, of our society. Uh, days gone by, the, uh, the focus of our agencies uh, coming together to build uh, sustainable communities. Uh, HUD, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, along with U.S. EPA, along with uh, <clears throat> the uh, department in trying to minimize the data at the time that showing that housing is a key determinant of, of health outcomes, where people live, uh, how they uh, travel, uh, they don't have access to mobility, uh, and where they play and where they work have an awful lot to say about what their social uh, determinant of health will be uh, in, a, in a given age uh, as they, as they uh, grow older. So I think we are in a place where we we'll see that kind of collaboration uh, come together. More specifically in Colorado as it relates to identifying uh, the mobility of these uh, youth uh, and students who are impacted uh, directly by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but also even pre-COVID, uh, uh, we've seen a growth of a uh, lot of younger people children, in fact, uh, living on the streets and finding their way. Um, Dr. Uh, Gers, I, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but your uh, connection is cutting in and out. OK. Oh, sorry uh, about that. Yeah. I'm not sure what to do about that, um, so maybe yeah. get a little closer, a little um, closer to the mic. Yeah, yeah, that might work. Um, and if it keeps Is happening, it might be good to um, try and log in and log out, back out, and, uh, log back out and log in and see if that helps. Okay. All right. Just, just, just let me just let me know. Uh, or at risk of uh, being uh, displaced out of uh, school districts. Uh, that program. Uh, is in collaboration with the local public uh, housing authorities, and largely how we identify the families that need assistance. Uh, oftentimes those individual families are already in a public housing uh, permanent setting or they have a housing choice voucher. So the challenge is the choice and move to a different part of the city that they wanna to move to and use that in the open market to get housing. We want to make sure that we are assisting them in getting that housing so their individual children have access to uh, uh, on, ongoing school access and education. So we are collaborating with others, health, uh, public uh, housing authorities, as well as some of the other state agencies I mentioned, uh, human services and the Department of Education. Uh, Secretary Sebelius indicated 
uh, the, uh, the health issues associated now with, with schools and how not just teachers, but uh, other staff and administrators now have a much uh, greater role in the lives of families and keeping them safe and healthy uh, than just uh, teaching the, uh, the numbers and the ABCs, uh, so to speak. Uh, so that has grown uh, immensely in working with school districts as being very, very critical uh, in a, a collaboration approach at the local level. Thank you so much. And so, sorry about the, the confusion with the mic. I appreciate you being uh, flexible there. Um, That's right. And Superintendent Thurmond, um, you know, in, in pre-pandemic times, schools and educators uh, played such a role in evaluating the health and safety of students. And this is something we, we previously mentioned a little bit. Um, you know, remote learning has made it really difficult to, uh, you know, monitor child abuse and monitor instances of, of children being neglected. Uh, because they're not in touch as directly with mandatory reporters and they're not seeing them face to face. Um, and so how is California approaching this? You know, how are, how are you prioritizing this, the safety of students right now um, and making sure that uh, somebody is, is keeping that eye on them to make sure that they're, they're healthy? Really important question, Julia. And, you know, as we're living in the area of remote discussion in our you know, audio goes out and our visual goes out. If mine goes out, just raise your hand and then go to another panelist. And then that way I'll know that we're not connecting. But, um, you know, I would just say we've been in regular conversation with our State Department of Human Services about um, the impacts it, on uh, children as it relates to job, child abuse um, and, uh, and, and neglect. I mean, that's where I started my career as a child abuse um, uh, social worker. You know, how do we prevent this? And without having our mandated reporters, you know, our teachers, it's harder to know what's happening when you're only interacting from a Zoom standpoint. Um, and so uh, we're working through ways to get around that. You know, one of the most important ways is what, what I call family engagement program, where you have programs that help uh, families be more connected to school. During the pandemic, we've seen many of our families become even more disconnected from school. If you tell a family member that doesn't have a computer that the only way you can connect with us is through email, you, you know that is just not a realistic way. You've gotta have phone lines, hotlines, and someone who can answer those phones and often who can speak multiple language. We saw this when we created the task force to close the digital divide and we asked all of our internet providers to provide internet to, to low-income families at $10 a month. And we said, you've gotta have you know, people available to staff those hotlines to take those calls and speak multiple languages. Otherwise, those resources will never get to those families. It'll be just one more barrier. And so, you know, we're building family engagement units at the department, uh, the State Department of Education to help local districts strengthen the way they do family engagement. And then I would just add this, you know, I, I think Secretary Sibili has talked about this. I think Director Garcia talked about this. You know, the combination of health and human services has been a, a, a important delivery. Um, the schools have been an important delivery node for this. And one of the ways that we talk about this is a, a concept called community schools, where the school becomes the hub for the delivery of health services for families and becomes the, a location to deliver mental health services and social services. Our state is rolling out a, a grant initiative right now to help more schools become community schools. Our governor has invested even more in his uh, most recent um, budget proposal and we, we're advocating for that. Again, we're also in agreement that accelerating the use of Medicaid, you know, historically there've been some barriers and sometimes states don't always uptake, you know, uh, in Medicaid, but now is the time to accelerate that, make it easier to apply. You know, we're sponsoring legislation that um, helps school districts with the startup operation on how to apply for Medi-Cal and then to understand the back end, how to bill for Medi-Cal. You know, it's a, uh, Medicaid is a great resource, but if you don't really understand the billing part of it, it is very difficult sometimes to get the resources that schools need. And, and let's face it, most of our schools don't have a nurse, don't have healthcare staff. And so we're really looking for ways to build this out. And I would just touch on the theme that I think both of our panelists have talked about. Interagency collaboration will be important. Um, there is no question, HUD will have to do more. Under, under President-elect Biden, we will need to see more money from HUD for our cities, for rent subsidies, you know, tiny home programs, 
um, uh, transitional housing programs for our foster youth and our homeless youth. We will need to see that level of investment that we have just not seen, certainly in the last four years. We'll also need to see that there is collaboration between HUD and Health and Human Services on the Medicaid components. Um, and we'll want to see that there, obviously the Department of Education, all these agencies working together. And then I would just say that we'll need to see, I believe, uh, additional stimulus support for small businesses uh, because let's face it, so many people are out of work, or, 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 you know, are facing eviction. And, and, and just in my mind, the support for the small business means making sure that, you know, men and women working in the community can get access to jobs, uh, you know, get help to get caught up on, on rent and mortgage payments. I think we're gonna need to see the kind of uh, economic stimulus that we saw uh, under President Obama when the economy was facing near collapse and the kinds of investments that were made to support our banking sector, to support small businesses, to support our traditional industries that are so important to the bottom line of the parents of our kids. And so, it, you know, investment in STEM jobs and computer science jobs where families can earn a decent wage. You know, in California, we've invested heavily in the earned income tax credit to help some of our lowest income families. The governor here has made a proposal to double down on that, provide even more dollars uh, for those families. And so I, I would just echo, uh, I'm preaching to the choir, but I would echo um, the, the comments of my colleagues on this panel that we need to see that multi-agency collaboration you know, get past silos so that we can help families when we know that their needs intersect and interconnect and we'll all be better off with that, with that, uh, with that collaboration. Thank you so much, Superintendent. And uh, we've got about 12 minutes left and I wanna try to get through as many questions as we possibly can. So I'll just remind uh, everyone to try to keep it a little bit brief so we can get through um, hopefully a few more. Um, and so uh, this one is from um, Representative Susan Fisher from the North Carolina General Assembly. Um, and she asks, you know, having introduced legislation at the state level to get uh, medical care for homeless students who weren't able to consent for their own treatment, um, one of the concerns that she heard about the most was opposition uh, for who would reimburse this for this care, excuse me. Um, so, uh, Secretary, I'll direct this towards you. Um, with a new federal administration, do you think uh, we'll see more of these resources available? And, and how do you think that rollout will look like? Oh, you're, you are still muted, actually. <laughs> I certainly hope so. I, I do think there's a, a very um, specific commitment uh, that the federal government response has to be the leader and has to be the most robust and driving resources through as many agencies as possible, but also getting rid of the barriers. I mean, I, I don't think we can underestimate how many now hurdles there are and trap doors there are where people were just vanishing and you know didn't sign up when they lost their health insurance at their jobs they didn't sign up for the children's health insurance plan because it's too damn complicated and if you just lost your job you that's not top of your mind so i think there's a knowledge in the federal government to make it seamless to make it easy it's one of the reasons medicaid could be the most the fastest doorway um, because there already are there are 77 million people currently enrolled in Medicaid. It's by far the biggest program in the country run by the federal government. It's by far the most money. Everybody has it. So that becomes a doorway to a lot of opportunities, including the one like the representative from North Carolina is talking about where you, know, you need to figure out a billing way. Medicaid is often the backup billing. So presumptive eligibility, making sure that those folks can seamlessly move through and then driving the money to state so that they can be the reimbursement engine. Thank you so much. And um, and I'll just keep moving quickly through, but um, this I'm, I'm direct, uh, gonna direct towards Director Garcia. And this is from uh, Chris, Kristen Chang from Makilteo School District. Uh, she's an elementary school counselor and she's, uh, asking about the, in Washington state, they have an eviction moratorium until March of 2021. And so um, she's wondering about how uh, counselors and other school employees can be proactive and prepare for that maybe impending wave that might be coming uh, in the next few months uh, once this moratorium expires. And, you know, is it, uh, and how can the school support in terms of connecting with community organizations or, uh, you know, how can they best be a resource there? 
Great question. Uh, thank you, Joe. I'm going to keep my uh, uh, camera off. I'm told it might actually uh, be better in terms of the uh, transmission. So thanks for that question. Um, you know, I think the uh, the point you is is a good one. That I know that uh, uh, many local uh, nonprofit uh, housing providers and those looking for uh, uh, assistance for uh, rental housing uh, are probably not thinking about on on the front end. So I I, uh, I commend the question because I think it, it exhibits a lot of, of uh, proactive thinking on the part of a school district. Because as I said earlier, uh, oftentimes it's the classroom teacher who has the most interaction with the uh, uh, challenges uh, that a student might be experiencing out of the classroom. I, I would suggest that uh, in, in, a, in a local uh, manner, if your local, uh, local government, if it's a municipality or a, a county, uh, I would reach out to the, uh, the human services agency you know, frankly, I, I might even start with your local elected uh, person, your council member or your commissioner, uh, wh whatever the former you might have, uh, and to suggest that this is a way to link uh, the uh, interaction early on. It's good to know in advance where these experiences are going to be and how you can track the families that are going to be on the edge of face action or maybe they're uh, delinquent in past uh, rental uh, payments you know, the, the consequences are gonna be the same. It's gonna be a challenge for, for a family. Uh, and then find ways to link those, those family needs directly to local uh, needs, uh, the uh, local service providers. Uh, I, I think that's the best way to get started. I think it's the most local manner in which to ensure that there's gonna be some follow through. I expect some local governments probably are already doing some of this kind of proactive outreach back into school districts. My guess is probably not enough of them are anticipating what these impacts are gonna be once the eviction moratorium expires. So good question. And those are some of the thoughts I have right off the top. Thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to also really quickly thank Secretary Sibelius. She unfortunately has to leave a couple minutes early. Um, Secretary, thank you so much for being here today and for all of your great insight. Uh, we really enjoyed having you. Thanks for having me. Thank you to the other two for participating. Bye-bye. Um, and so I'm going to jump in now um, and, and have a question for Superintendent Thurmond. Oh, so Superintendent, it looks like you're about to say something. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so uh, this is a kind of a combo question. Um, it's from uh, Rashida Crutchfield from uh, California State University, Long Beach, um, as well as uh, Regla Perez-Pino from Prince William County Public Schools. And they're wondering about, you know, we we briefly discussed how some of these issues disproportionately impact uh, black and brown students and um, how can policymakers really work to ensure that these underlying social problems that uh, you address, the systemic racism, the, the challenges there um, are really tied into um, th this movement to address questions of food and housing insecurity. Uh, thank you uh, for the question. I know that at Cal State University and our UC system uh, and our private uh, universities and community colleges are all working together um, to increase programs to address food insecurity and housing uh, instability. Um, we've worked also with them on how to ensure that there's a low cost internet for our higher ed students because we also know that that's been a barrier. Um, at the end of the day, I think we're going to have to work with um, the agencies that do um, tenant organizing and education to help prevent evictions. And our state governments and our federal governments are going to have to invest in programs to support housing uh, subsidies, especially for transitional age youth and for young people going into college. We have, we have a great program here, you know, that supports housing subsidies that helps, you know, our, our, our young people get their first apartment and helps them to pay for, especially those coming out of foster care. And so, um, you know, we'll be working with our legislature and our governor uh, on how to expand funding to address housing uh, insecurity uh, and food insecurity. Thank you so much, uh, Superintendent. Um, and unfortunately, we're coming up on time. We've just got a few minutes left. Um, I just really want to thank uh, Superintendent Fairman, Director Garcia, as, as well as Secretary Sibelius for being with us today, um, as well as everyone who took the time to attend. This is a really great conversation. Um, I, I wish we could have gotten to more questions because I think we could have gone on for, for the entire day if we were able to. Um, but 
uh, I'm just going to do a few quick last um, last minute wrap up things. Um, so um, we will, if you do have a follow up question, you know, please feel free to reach out to anyone here at the Hunt Institute, um, whether that be on social media, via email, whatever it might be. We are happy to provide that information. We're here to serve as a resource to you. Um, and we will post a recording of this presentation as well as a, a, just kind of a recap blog on our website within a week. Um, if you want to watch it earlier than that, please feel free to look, uh, go to our Facebook page. It will be up there immediately after this conversation. Um, and then finally, um, we have a lot of webinar opportunities here through the Hunt Institute, um, both our homeroom series as well as a number of, a number of other series. Um, and so if you are interested in attending any of them, uh, I'm going to just quickly go through a couple of the upcoming opportunities, but please also feel free to look on our website, which will have all of the information. Uh, this Friday, um, we have uh, governing principals um, engaging historically underserved students through career and technical education. We have a great panel uh, coming up for that. Uh, on Tuesday the 26th uh, for our post-secondary pathways series, uh, we'll be talking about supporting adult learners. Uh, we have some really great uh, education leaders, uh, higher education leaders from around the country on that one. Um, and then our next homeroom webinar will be on the uh, February 9th, Tuesday, February 9th, and we will have Dr. Paige Brumley, Dr. Sharon Contreras, uh, Dr. Tom Kane, and Dr. Robert Yeagers uh, discussing how to use data to really support non-academic needs of students, which will be a great follow-up to this conversation, kind of get a little bit into the uh, details of how we can really use data to support some of these uh, challenges we were discussing today. Um, and once again, please feel free to visit our website. Uh, we have an upcoming webinars page that will have more information about all of these webinars and more. And then uh, finally, at the end of this webinar, you'll just be brought to a, just a brief um, survey link. If you have a couple seconds to do that, that would be great. Uh, we just use it for our internal evaluation purposes. Um, but thank you once again to the Super Superintendent Thurman, uh, Director Garcia for joining us. This is really great. Thanks for having us and thank you for convening this very important conversation. All stay safe and well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and everyone else have a great day.